have a lot of things to share with you tonight or today. And we are going through the book of Luke verse by verse. This is a uh, basically for the remainder of my time being a pastor for the rest of my life, I want to take you through a, a book of the Bible verse by verse. Right now we are in the book of Luke. We'll be here for a couple of years. We are in week 18. When we get finished with this in about a little more than a year and a half, we'll pick up the book of Acts. And when we get in the book of Acts, we'll go through that. But we'll, when we get to where Paul writes the letter to the people of Ephesus, we'll pause the book of Acts, go to the book of Ephesians, teach the book of Ephesians, come back to the book of Acts. So that's a five-year project. So I've got you ready for the next seven years. What's going to happen? All the time, there can be little interjections of different guest speakers coming, to people talking, a word from the Lord, something happening, and we can pause, but we'll get back on the direction we're going. Today, I want to talk to you about questions and answers about healing, questions that have come from you, things that, are, that pertain to the subject of healing. We are in Luke chapter 5, where Luke records uh, just a fabulous, fabulous healing of a person that has leprosy. Then he records the healing of a person who was paralyzed, and he forgave him of his sins. So last week we talked in great detail about the power of God to heal is the same power of God that forgives sins. The same power of God that forgives sins is the same power of God that heals. That God the Father and Jesus Christ put them into the same process, the same thought, the same cross, the same sacrifice, the same blood, the same burial, the same resurrection, the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God doesn't see them to be different. The thing that we have to learn about is how do we walk in that health and how do we walk in that healing? So these are the questions that have uh, arisen from you guys. And the first one is, is uh, why, why did God let so-and-so die? Next one. Is it God's will not to heal some people? Is it God's will just to say no, he doesn't want to heal some people? Does God hold back healing or tell people to wait? It's not your time. Wait, wait, wait. The next one is, why doesn't everyone prayed for get healed? Why does every single per person that's ever prayed for get healed? The next one, I don't see why I need a level 7 or a level, or a level 10 faith to be healed. Why wouldn't a small measure like a mustard seed be sufficient? And no, question number six, we're going we're to talk about all these. I just thought I'd give you the questions. Does it sound good so far? Question number six, we prayed, we believe, so why didn't God heal whomever? Whomever. Have you ever heard these questions? Number seven, question number seven, why doesn't God just use his power, step in, and just heal them? Maybe you asked one of these questions. These are the questions that have come from you as I've talked to you the last couple of weeks about healing. I want to talk about every one of these. I want to share with you and I want to go on record today. And um, I don't see my sound guy. Did we lose him? Did he leave? Do we? I just want to make sure we have a recording. They had a piece of equipment right before church at 9.30 today die. That piece of equipment sends the audio signal to two CD players and an MP3 player for the recording. They rewired it to make sure that just the mp3 player is going to get the recording so that there is a recording. Today is so important, we can't miss. So there will be no CD available immediately after church because they'll have to turn the mp3 into a CD and then make copies of it so it won't be available to next week. But it will, the mp3 will be online to download for free probably this afternoon. Very possible it'll be you know, available immediately um, if not by Monday or Tuesday. In the meantime, you may want to take really good notes. I want to go on record today and share with you some things that are going to talk to you about God's thought process about healing. I also want to share with you why a person doesn't get healed. What I'm going to share with you fits 100% of the cases 100% of the time. I'm going to tell you why a person who prayed and didn't get healed, why so-and-so was prayed for by 3,000 people and God didn't heal them, why? This is a biggie. Some of you are going to say, oh, okay, I get it. Some of you are going to say, I don't agree with you at all. And some of you are going to just have to wait to get to heaven to hear from God that I was right. <laughs> but I want to begin. I want to begin with this thought process again. Sin 
and healing are in the same act of God's love for mankind. The very same act of God's love for mankind. You need to understand that in Luke chapter 5, you got your, your Bibles open to Luke chapter 5. Look at verse 22. Here's what it says. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had, was laying on, went home, and, went on, and, and he went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. There, I just wanted to make sure the MP3 has a signal. Thank you. I want, again, these scriptures take Jesus Christ's thought process in God the Father and puts healing and salvation in the exact same place. The very, very, very same place. If you understand that concept so much so, if you get that, if you believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ are on the same page about healing and forgiveness, then ask yourself this question. Would God say no to anyone who is asking for salvation? No. Would God, is it God's will for anybody to go to hell? No. Is God withholding salvation from some people by saying to them, no, today's not the day I want you to get saved. You need to wait. No. You need to wait a couple more months. The time isn't right then it has to be the exact same answer for healing. Has to be. Has to be. God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son are on the same page. So who must not be on that page? What's an amazing thing, when it comes to spiritual forces in a person's life, there are three spiritual forces in a life. There's God, there is Satan... And there is you. And in these forces that connect together, let me put it this way. There is God's kingdom. There's God's kingdom. There is the kingdom of Satan. And there's the kingdom you're building. You have a kingdom that you build. And what kingdom are you building? Are you going to get on the page with God or the page with Satan and build your kingdom after Satan or after God? Or are you going to do a blend? Are you going to be a hybrid kingdom? Take a little of this and a little of that. Or are you going to be, do what Jesus said to do? Seek first all the kingdom of God and all these other things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. All this other stuff will be, will be added to you. So you've got to ask yourself, which one are you doing? And do you know spiritual forces? Do you understand how the spiritual world works? The problem with most people is they think like people. Is they don't think spiritual. They don't analyze from the viewpoint of God. They analyze from the viewpoint of man. And they usually look at it as man is suffering. Why are you allowing this suffering to take place? If you're so powerful, why don't you just step in and stop this suffering? You don't get it. Well, pastor, tell me. Hang around for four years. In other words, there are certain things you won't get in the very first time you hear it. Very first time you've heard it doesn't mean that you're going to get it. How do you go to a second grader and teach him trig? Okay, kids, put away those crackers. How do you go to a preschooler who's pulling the little thing that says farmer says and tell that preschooler stuff of, that has to do with an, that you would need an engineer's degree to comprehend? There are things in the spiritual world that we know what questions to ask, but maybe we haven't accumulated the knowledge necessary to understand the answer when it is given. So the fact that we may not know is not a sign of being an idiot, stupid, weak, or anything else. It's a sign that we are humans who are seeking the kingdom of God. That we're going after the kingdom of God. We're going after all that he has. And he has a whole lot of things for us. But here's what I'd like you to also grasp. Father God loves you and he wants to bless your life. Do you believe that? 
Father God loves you. He wants, he wants to bless your life. Did you know that the Bible says that long life and length of days are a blessing from God? You cannot have long life and you cannot have length of days. Do you know what that means? Long life means to live a long time. Length of days means to get a lot done in one day. You cannot be multitasking. You cannot be effective. You cannot live a long time if you are constantly sick. Therefore, when God put this in motion, he had a plan in his, in his head that you should be well. So here's what I like to go on record as. It is God's will 100% of the time, absolutely every single time, to heal you. It is God's will for every single person to be well as it is God's will to be, to, to be saved. You say, well, pastor, then why doesn't everybody get healed? Does everybody get saved? Does everybody get saved? Now, here's what I'd like you to grasp and understand. I'm going to share with you some really deep spiritual truths that will help you comprehend how to be well. And uh, what I don't want you to do is just shut your ears and get mad and say, well, that's not me. That didn't happen to me. That's not the way it worked for me. Your experience doesn't validate God's word. God's word validates itself. Now, what we need to understand is that we cannot look at our experience and just say, well, look at, look what I have. For an example, there's a person who's passed away and he's in heaven right now. But um, years ago, years ago, he prayed for his mother to be healed. He comes from a background, from a spiritual background, that, um, that his, he's a minister and he's passed away now. But he's a minister, and he's a minister his whole life, well-respected, wrote several books, well-respected in certain sectors of the, of the community for this expertise in certain areas. And he came from a background that believed in healing in the atonement, that healing is in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He came from a denomination that preached healing. He, he saw people get healed. His mother got very ill. He prayed for his mother to be healed. She died. It caused such a bitterness in him that he changed his philosophy and said, and his theology, he changed his theology and said that he prayed, he believed, he knew that she'd be healed and she still died, therefore God's will is not to heal everybody. He made a conclusion off his own experience because he made this assumption he couldn't be wrong. He couldn't have been wrong. He should know everything. He, should, he knew everything taking place. He knew all the facts around. He knew everything about his mom, everything about him, everything about God. And therefore, it, I can conclude. And he spent the rest of his life teaching against healing. And went the rest of his life bad-mouthing other Christian leaders who taught on healing. I thought, why? Because you had an experience that didn't work the way you thought it should. And you couldn't explain it, therefore you explain it the way you see it. The fact that you can't explain something doesn't mean you're right. Amen. Amen. Doesn't mean your conclusion is correct. In my lifetime... My short, 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 short lifetime. They told us not to eat butter, eat margarine. They told us eggs were bad. Don't eat any eggs. They're bad. They reversed it and said butter's better than margarine. Eggs are good. When I was in elementary school, we had nine planets in our solar system. When my kids went through elementary school, there was ten. The grandkids are going, it's back to nine. <laughs> My friend, man does not have all the answers. They're giving it their best shot. We give it our best shot. Now, I would like you to grasp a few things really important. God said that he loves you so very, very much that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever believe in him should not perish. God wants every one of his children healed. He wants them all healed. He wants them all to be well. But there's some things that are necessary for it to operate and it to happen. Did you know nobody goes to heaven because God wants them to? Not one person has ever gone to heaven because God wants them to. 
They've gone to heaven because they said yes to Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says clearly that it is God's will that no one should perish. And anyone who calls on the name of the Lord should go, will be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be well. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will, will be given eternal life. Then why are people going to hell? It must be because God wants some of them to go to hell. There are denominations who have that theology. They have the theology that predestination is made way before you were ever created, and God made a certain group of people go to heaven and a certain group of people go to hell. That is crazy. Because it goes contradiction to Scripture where Jesus Christ died. He died for you. That's what I want you to understand. Just because God wills for it doesn't mean he gets his will. God doesn't want anybody going to hell. It's not up to him. He's done his part so far. Man has to do their, his part. So, well, Pastor, do you mean then if I don't get healed, it you know, could be my fault? Why don't we just listen and quit pointing the fault to anybody? And here's what I'd like to do. By the end of the day, I want to get you to a place where you know how to be prayed for, how to receive uh, healing by faith, how that you can turn any situation around and get on the journey of being well. But I want to support a couple of things with Scripture. Matthew chapter 21, 22 says this. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. Matthew eleven twenty four. 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you receive it, and it will be yours. And John chapter 16, verse 23 says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Now, are these scriptures true or not? So let me ask this question. Someone says, Pastor, I prayed and I asked God for a brand new car. I asked God for a new car. God is going to give me a new car. Do you know what you want to do? You want to open your front door, walk out to your driveway, and have it there. Yeah. Bang. Oh, it's God. I remember, I was, uh, I was only a Christian you know, here's what I mean. I got saved when I was 14 years old. I was raised in church, but I saved at 14. But it wasn't until I was 19 when I decided I should do something with my life and Jesus Christ. And it wasn't until 20 I got kind of serious about doing things. So now I'm, I'm this whopping 21-year-old. And I'm, and I'm asking God. I'm learning some things. I'm learning some things of prayer. So I ask, and I ask God for a new car because I needed one really bad. Well, some things were worked out. A deal was worked out, and I was able to lease a car, a brand new car. I was floored, and I knew it was a deal that God put together. I went to a home Bible study and told this person, God got me a new car. It's right there. And I told him the deal, and he said this. That wasn't God, because if it was God, it would have been just given to you. I walked away from that a little confused. You know, I'm 21. I know five Bible verses. <laughs> and I really thought God gave that to me. Now, I'm in my brand new car. He's in his automobile. I'm driving home, and I'm saying, God, I really think this is from you. And then I found in the Bible it says every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. And it was God. But for some reason we think that if God is going to really answer it, our prayer, that it would just bang, there's the car. Bang, there's the healing. Bang, there's the new job. Bang, there's this. But what I found out is something very, very different in how the kingdom of God operates. Jesus Christ mentions, one of the questions was, what about a, a mustard seed faith? Which I thought was a really, really good question because when Jesus used that analogy, he uses a mustard seed starts off small, but gets bigger and grows. So, yes, you can begin with mustard seed faith, but it has to grow to the place to have God finish the work. Jesus was using it as an example of something that's growing and something getting more and more inside your life. But let me continue on a couple of things. I want you to understand that these scriptures are given to you to live in this, this world. I said that God has a kingdom. 
Satan has a kingdom, and you're building a kingdom. Did you know that this world is cursed? Read the book of Genesis. God cursed it. And he said that you're going to labor, that man would labor. Did you know God said that what's going to happen is you're going to go get a job and you're going to go work? So that would mean God has put a system into being. Then what he does is he says in the book of Deuteronomy, I said before you, life, death, blessing and cursing, you choose. He says, choose life. Well, what do you mean? He says that right here in this world is death. You live in a death world. You live in a world that is dead, and it is it, evolution is true, but it's going the other way. We're not evolving into greater form life. We are evolving into an even more evil form of life. Just because we have more technology doesn't mean that we are more advanced. Look in history. There are places, plenty of times in history, where people were far more concerned about other people and lived far better in love towards their neighbor than we do today. And they didn't have a cell phone. Right from my phone, I can tweet. I can Facebook. I can email. I can text mail. But if I have not love, I am nothing. That's first, that's first Corinthians 13 A. Yeah. <laughs> but what you, what you need to understand is God has set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. What he's saying is you live in a death world if you follow my wisdom, if you follow my guidance, if you follow what I tell you to do, you will live in life in death. You'll, you'll bring life to death. You'll be alive, you'll be a light, you'll be a salt. You'll be powerful. You'll be big. I'm going to tell you right now. There is a lot of comfort to our emotions when a preacher says to another person who lost somebody that's very, very close and very, very dear to them. We say, well, it's just God's will that he have them in heaven. What we're saying is we really don't know how to answer. Because we don't all have the answer. What we do know is we live in a warfare. The devil hates people hates them. But I want you to understand, God is the one that's on your side and loves you with all his heart, loves you more than anything else. God is the one that gave you his son. God is not the one withholding anything from you. God is the one that is saying that I care about you. He's the one saying, pray and I'll give it to you. He's the one saying, ask and believe and I'll do it. He's the one that's saying, follow my ways and receive my rewards. The thing that probably hurts the heart of God more than anything else, and when something happens in this world that is bad, evil, or, or hurtful, or painful, and we blame God for it, and we get bitter to him, that hurts his heart more than anything else because he said, you just aren't getting it. You're not getting it. That's not what I'm trying to do. It's not what's going on. Then we'll have someone say this. Well, God is so powerful. He's so awesome. He's so big. He's so powerful. Why doesn't he just heal him? Just step in and heal him. Why doesn't he break every rule of wisdom, every law that he's ever created? Why doesn't he just go against all that he has ever done and just heal him? Because I'm in pain and I don't want my friend hurting anymore. God, just heal him. And then we get mad and we think by manipulating God, getting mad at God, that God will bend his back and heal him. Or we say, God, if, heal, if you would heal this person, if you'll do this, if you do that, then so-and-so would get saved. And we try to bargain with God. We try to do all kinds of things. And God is saying, God, there's, there's another way. There is another way. There's a biblical way. There's a scriptural way. There's God's way and God's results. God wants us to move in a powerful, powerful way. Why don't you turn to Psalms 103. Would you do that, please? Psalms 103. Look at Psalms 103, verse 2. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Look what it says, verse 3. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. Underline the phrase, he made known his ways to Moses. In other words, Moses knew how God did it. The people saw God do it. It's a big difference. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Look at verse 9. He will not always accuse, nor really harbor his anger forever. And verse 10, the biggest Bible verse in all the Bible for all the legalistic preachers. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Somebody will say, well, God isn't going to heal you because you have sin in your life. God says right here that he doesn't treat you according to your sin. If God treated us according to our sin, we would all be crispy critters. We'd be toast. I mean, we'd, we'd be the ashes of ashes. But thank God he doesn't do that. If, if you believe that God will not heal you, you will not be healed. If you believe that God doesn't heal, you'll, have a, you'll only be healed by the mercy of God and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you believe that God sometimes withholds healing, if you believe that it is not God's will to heal, you're going to have a journey that is very, very struggling and hard. You've got to believe that God wants you healed as much as you want to be healed. Well, then, Pastor, why isn't he so powerful? Let's get into it. Look at Psalms chapter, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. You're in Psalms, just go right, go over to the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 3, look at verse 13. Here's what it says. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided, and the clouds let down, let drop the dew. In other words, wisdom understands why it rains. Wisdom understands which ocean is in which place, which sea is in what location, and which mountain is in which location by the thoughts and wisdoms of God. Moses understood why and how God did the miracles that delivered him from the land of Egypt. The people watched. Moses understood. He knew the wisdom of God that brought down the dew for the manna. He understood when the water came out of the rock. When, when Moses went against the wisdom of God, instead of speaking to the rock, hitting the rock, God said to Moses, you will not go into the promised land. Because Moses knew what he was supposed to do and he didn't do it. Moses was moved by his emotions and not by his knowledge and his wisdom and the wisdom of God. This scripture says the wisdom of God built everything. This scripture says that found in the wisdom of God is health and prosperity. This scripture says that found in God's wisdom, found in his wisdom is his ways. And his glory. This scripture is saying that wisdom plays a big, big part in the creation of everything, which means everything is operating by it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 8. In Proverbs chapter 8, I have it highlighted because the entire proverb is extremely important, extremely important. In Proverbs chapter 8, I believe it reveals why a person doesn't get healed. I believe it, it communicates what is preventing a person from having that experience of healing. Let me ask you this. Why does a person end up in hell? 
God had Jesus Christ die. God put Jesus on the cross. God had Jesus resurrected. God paid the price for, for sickness, disease, for sin. He paid the price for eternal life. And God said, heaven is open, but it's a, it's a narrow road. It is the way of Jesus Christ. Why does somebody go to hell? Someone goes to hell because they didn't get it. They don't have the wisdom that's behind the act of salvation. They didn't know. They believed that their wisdom was greater than God's wisdom. They believed, I don't believe that. How many times have you heard some... I'm calming down. How many times have you heard some famous person get on TV because they're famous just because they've been in a movie? When a lot of people saw the movie and thought that they were a good actor or actress. Did you know a good actor and a good actress doesn't mean that they're a good person? I prefer not to know. I don't want to read People magazine. I don't want to know behind the scenes. I don't want to know anything about that kind of stuff because it messes up watching Mission Impossible 3. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to watch Die Hard. I don't want to know about your personal life. You get right with God. But there, how many times is someone going, if I was God, I would. That's such a stupid statement. If God is such a loving God, why are there so many people suffering in this world? All the time. They're just not getting it. They don't get it. What you've got to do is you've got to understand how things are operating now. In Proverbs chapter 8, this is, I would like you to listen to this proverb and see what is being said here. Look at verse 1. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Okay, that verse says this. The wisdom, this entire chapter is about the wisdom of God. And it's saying here, wisdom is standing on a high place, calling out. Calling out to lead people in the way of God. Wisdom is standing on a high mountain, calling to the entire world about salvation. About the goodness of God. About the love of God. When I read my Bible, all I find out is that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, God does all he can to give them a blessed life. And that blessed life is determined by him, not by you, because you have a definition of blessed, and God has a definition of blessed, but God wants them on a journey that changes their life from that point all the way until they get to heaven. According to their faith, the Bible says over and over and over and over. But here what you need to understand is wisdom is calling out and a person ends up in hell because they didn't believe and accept or know the wisdom that God had already been calling out. Preachers are all over the world. People are all over the world in streets, in bars, in um, workplaces telling people about Jesus Christ. But a person chooses not to accept that, not to go that way, not to have that. And then they end up not seeing and not getting what God has for them. But wisdom goes a lot deeper than that. A lot, lot deeper than that. Verse 2. On the heights along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Besides the gates, leading into the city at the entrance, she cries aloud. To you, O man, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. That doesn't mean that this was written and she doesn't do it anymore. This is what's happening present tense. This is what's going on today. This is what's going on right now. This is what's going on constantly. Wisdom is calling out to all mankind. Wisdom is calling for man to repent. Wisdom is calling for man to follow God. Wisdom is calling man to understand God's way. It says here, um, look at verse 5. To you, you who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish gain understanding. Listen, or I have wor for I have worthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. My lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is cricket or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are faultless to, to those who have knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. 
For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Then listen to this. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. In other words, another word for prudence is common sense. Knowledge for everyday living. I, wisdom, stand with common sense. I, wisdom, instruct everyday living. I, wisdom, am the boss. Here's what it says. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have understanding and power. By me, kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. In other words, there's a wisdom for governing. By me, princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. I love those who love me and those who hate me or seek me. Those who seek me find me. With me, here's what it says, with wisdom are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasures full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of all his works before the deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began. In other words, what we're about to read is that God is declaring that he chose the DNA of this world is wisdom. That he said, wisdom is the very first thing that I am going to bring into existence. And I'm going to build everything by wisdom. Everything works by the wisdom of God. Your body does, this earth does, the solar systems do. Every single thing works by the wisdom of God. And here's what it says. The Lord brought me forth at the, is the first of his works before the deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning before the world began. Then there were, when there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or its fields or anything of dust of the world, I was there when he set the heavens in place. When he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed secure, securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its, bound, its boundary as so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. In other words, God was building everything from the very foundation, started with wisdom, with man in his mind. God built everything with man in his mind. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Here it is. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise and do not ignore it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway, for whoever finds me finds life and receives favor or grace from the Lord. But whoever fails to find me harms himself. All who hate me love death. This scripture says this. God built everything by wisdom. Wisdom is the beginning, and everything operates by wisdom. Everything operates by wisdom. God has a plan that he has put in operation, and whatever he does has to follow that wisdom plan with man in mind. When everything happens, I want to say this to you. You are only one wisdom thought away from any blessing God has for you. The only thing that's preventing from you getting born again is you ex exercising and believing in the wisdom that God has for you. And that's the wisdom of heaven. The only thing that's between you and a manifestation of your healing is the wisdom of God. 
is you knowing that wisdom, that thought, that, th that process, that journey. For an example, let's go back to the car. The guy in the Bible study said, I didn't get the car from God because it would have been just given to me. That's stupid. That's man's thoughts. God's thoughts is this. God, I want a new car. He says, okay, I'm going to give you the wisdom to obtain it. You're going to have the ability either to lease, buy, or purchase outright. It means you are going to start a journey to get that car. You're not going to get the car today. You're getting the wisdom today, and you're going to have the car in the future. How long that future is is going to be applying that wisdom to that situation. Now, do you want to pay cash for the car? Then let's get a savings plan going. Let's follow wisdom in finances. Let's put money away every month. And when the money has accumulated, go buy the car. And then you'll say, well, that wasn't God. That was me saving the money. Then you're an idiot. You're full of pride. You're arrogant. Because what you need to understand... It is God the one that's giving you the thought. God is the one that's giving you the plan. God is the one that's giving you the journey. You start the journey of healing all the time. Well, every single time you get prayed for, you have started the journey of healing, the process of healing, and God is trying to get that healing to you as fast as he possibly can. But here's the issue. Well, we look at all these questions that we have. We have the question, why did God let so-and-so die? Is it God's will not to heal some? Why? Why do you think death is failure? Why do humans think that dying is failure? When the Bible says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? You beat death already by calling on the name of the Lord. And for some reason we think, oh look at so and so. They prayed, they believed, and they died. What is that? What are you saying? You're saying, see, didn't work. It wasn't God. Did God take them to heaven? Oh, yes, absolutely. Then death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? You lost. Death, you lost. What you need to understand, death is not, I'm not saying, oh, we should all go die. That's stupid too. <laughs> I'm really spitting a lot. That's why the chairs are where they're at. <laughs> we calculated the distance. <sighs> there is a wisdom. There is a wisdom that God has for you. There is a plan that God has for you. There is wisdom. And what you do is you prevent the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God of operating. For an example, when you understand... What I'm saying, you get why grace is so important. Do you know what grace is? Grace is God's favor and ability for you to succeed. You cannot be saved without grace. What I mean by that is God had to use his ability in your life and have a manifestation of salvation. You cannot be healed without the grace of God. You have to receive the grace of God, God's ability, God's favor. He's extending it to you. He wants you to be well. God is trying to get you healed. Trying to get you well. Trying to make things happen in your life. You are one wisdom thought away. We were, Suzette and I were at a pastor's conference on Friday and Saturday. And um, a couple of my personal friends were there speaking. One of them is Jim Reeve. He's pastor in uh, in Covina. And he was talking about the very first time he was ever at Dr. Cho's church in South Korea when he was visiting. And his comment was this. He said, at the end of the service, near the end of the service, he said, they're sitting in this... Now, Dr. Cho has the world's largest church, ev the largest church ever in human history, pushing 900,000 people. Wow. That's, that's a pretty good big church. <laughs> I don't know about you. You know... I mean, they have Sunday school classes bigger, bigger than our church. But here's what I, he said that he was there in, in the, the auditorium. I've actually been in his church a couple of times. And, um, 
and he was there, and there's a section where foreigners can sit and wear headphones, and it's translated into your language. And this time, there was a delegation from the United States. He said, I want everybody that's in this church, because of the teaching of this church and of Jesus Christ, you are now a millionaire. Please stand up. He said over 300 people stood up. And he pointed his finger up to the people from America. He goes, you Americans, you know what you think? That you pray that God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, and you pray and that you'll go to your mailbox and find a check from some long dead relative or something that's coming back to you. Not us Koreans. God gives us idea. We go do it. Right. Look at these guys. They got a thought and went and did it. What you have to understand is wisdom is what brings it all in. Wisdom is what you're built on. Wisdom is the DNA of this world, and you need the wisdom of God for your healing. So, well, Pastor, why doesn't God just heal? Why doesn't he just do it? I prayed and I believed. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you this very hard question that hurts everybody when I say this, when I ask. We say, we got together, we prayed, and we believed. We believed, we believed, we believed, and my friend didn't get healed. Scripture says, if you believe, you shall receive. What do we do with that? We trust our own experience or we trust the Scripture? Because as soon as you take your experience and, and, and you then interpret scripture by your experience, you're going to fall into false doctrine. That would mean this. If I believed that I prayed, if I believed, I believe I believed. Does that make sense? I believe I believed. And we got together, we believed that we believed, and we read and we believed that we believed. And it's God's will for them to be healed. Then there's something that I don't know. Well, then what is it? We don't know. If we knew, we'd get it. And in each case, it's different. But each case, it's all the same. Wisdom. Every one of those cases is the wisdom of God. Every single one of them. What we do know is we believed all that we could, so we, we used all our energy of faith and all of our emotion and all our, our experience and all of our scripture. We brought it together and we came together as a team and we prayed and we believed. And God wants them well. They want well. There's something we don't know. There is something you don't know. And in every case, it's different. Can I give you an example? It's going to be a difficult example, but see if you can get through this process and this thought. Someone says, why can't I just, why doesn't God just jump in and just heal him and just bypass whatever the wisdom, just break wisdom and just do it? Because it would have to go against whatever he planned at the beginning of the foundation of the earth. And some things happen in life because we make certain decisions and certain choices that we can't now, now we have to live through them. For an example, if we follow that thought process of God saying, God, why don't you just come in and just, whatever the wisdom is, we don't care what it is, just forget it and just heal them. Just heal them. Does that break some other rules that God has already put into boundaries someplace else? For an example, I don't know how many times I've had this experience in my life of being a pastor and someone coming to me and saying, Pastor, I've been married for 15 plus years, and I realize I never should have married that person in the first place, ever. It was a mistake to marry them. I shouldn't have married them, but I did, and now I realize we, it was never God's will for me to marry them, and now I have found, I believe, this my real soulmate. So I'm going to leave this person to go to them. I say, no, you're not. No, you're not. But it's not God's will, so you chose it. Now you're going to bring God's will into the situation. But God never wanted me to marry them in the first place. That all changed when you said, I do. <laughs> now God said, here you are. Let's work with it. 
But life has been hell. Let's work with it. So now what you're saying is, if God just comes in and heals this person, then those other laws should also be broken as well. How does God do this? How does God bring... Now, God has brought in the gift of healing, the working of miracles, discerning of spirits, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, gifts of the Holy Spirit to relieve mankind of suffering. God has brought in people who have special giftings. Tonight, Nasir's Nasir, 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 Nasir. The guy from Pakistan. Nasir. That's what I'm going to say. Anyway, the guy. He's going to be here tonight, and he has, he has a gift of healing. A gift. God has orchestrated through his wisdom for these gifts to operate in the DNA of wisdom, the DNA of the world, and to relieve mankind of suffering, and to bring in stuff in people's lives, and deliverance, and healing, and blessing people's life. God wants to bring into your life. God wants to bring into your life deliverance and healing. Now let me talk to you real, real, real quick. And what I want to talk to you about is how to receive healing. Can I do that? Just a couple of steps. All right? How to receive healing. See, Pastor, if I'm sick, what do I do? First thing that you need to do, first thing, is you need to have Bible verses on healing. You need to have Bible verses on healing. Now, let me back up a little bit. I have prayed for people in this church, in this church, who don't exist today. They're not on this earth. They're in heaven. I prayed for them to be healed. They are in heaven. We have walked through the process with people where they thought because the person died that there, it was a failure. No, no, no. We are trying to keep them on the earth as long as possible, but we live in another kingdom. And we said we lived in that kingdom when we said yes to Jesus Christ many years ago. You don't belong to this world anymore. You're not the property of this world. But what we do want to do is we want to keep our family as long as we can. We want them to live as long as life. We want them to live long life and length of days. We want to work through things. And I know, I know people in this church um, who have lost loved ones, who, um, who have suffered physically through different things. I know people who are working through their salvation in different ailments and pains and suffering. And I'm praying for them regularly to be delivered and be well. But what I have found out after a tremendous amount of study and, and research, that it is not God ever, ever, ever holding back the healing. It is not God saying no. It is not God not wanting them to be well. But it is us finding that wisdom thought to follow. Or several thoughts. Wisdom is what brings the healing. Direction and, and deliverance from God. Wisdom is what brings salvation. But the first thing that we have to do is we have to believe God wants us well. God wants us healed. So, well, Pastor, um, so-and-so had this disease and they didn't get healed. Can you tell me why? No, because I don't have the wisdom. And if God gives me that wisdom, I would be able to share. But there are, I have found that the stories are so different, vastly different, that you can't just take an answer. For an example, um, there's a man when I was, when I was, I was, how old was I? I was in my late 20s, pastoring. There's a man who was fighting cancer in the hospital named Brian Pritchard. And Brian was fighting cancer and fighting cancer and fighting cancer. We did everything. We did everything. We prayed for him. We spoke. We had people at the, at the hospital 24-7 praying for him. He had a team of 15 people that were praying, and they'd swap, and they'd rotate. They'd rotate. He everybody that he's well, he's healed. He was saying all the right things. 
He came to church. They brought him to church in a wheelchair. He couldn't even get out of the wheelchair. Didn't have any energy. We had a healing, um, a person, a guest speaker who had a healing gift there that night at church. Walked over to him, prayed for him while he's in the chair. The power of God hit him. He got up out of the chair, walked around the chair, and walked around the building. Folded the chair up and went home out of the chair. Three weeks later, back in the hospital. Three weeks later, back in the hospital, dying. Dying. People all looked and what happened? I thought God healed him. What's going on? So many people are praying. So many people are believing. So many people are doing this. And, and I'm in, I get called to the hospital I, and I visit him several times. I'm in the hospital with him and I'm praying for him. And he said, Pastor, could I talk to you privately? I said, sure. And he even asked his wife to leave the room. Everyone left the room. At me. He goes, I'm going to tell you why I can't be healed. I said, why? He's 32 years old. Wife, two children. God wants me to preach and I don't want to do it. I just don't want to do that. I would rather die. He's telling me this. And he says, I want you to help my wife to understand. And I said, Let's talk about this for a moment. We did 30, 40 minutes. And he was there. He said, I'm not going to get healed. I'm going to die. I want her to release me. I said, then why are you keep saying that by his stripes I am healed? He bore my sickness and carried my infirmities. Why are you saying all that? He said, because they, and he was talking about the group of intercessors and his wife, expect me to say that. And it just made life easier when he said it. So he brought his wife in. And the three of us had a meeting. That's a pretty emotional meeting. She processes. Takes her three days to process it. And we are back together. And she says, okay, I'm ready to do it. And the three of us prayed. And he released, she released him. And I think in 48 hours, he was gone. Before all that, in the talk, I said, Brian, can I have permission to tell your story? He said, yes. You can use my name. You can tell my story. The wisdom. He was healed out of a chair. Walked to the car. He was well. But he refused to follow the wisdom of God for long life and length of days. He was called to the ministry. He didn't want to do it. Now, I can't use that example for everybody. But in his case, I was able to see the wisdom because if I had not had that conversation and he had died, I would not be able to answer anybody. I had no clue what was going on. But here... I told you about the minister who prayed for his mom and the mom died. And then he got on this, he changed his theology and went after aggressively communicating that healing is not in the atonement. Smashing other people's faith. But there's something he didn't know. Do I know? No, I don't, but God does. God knows that wisdom. There is a wisdom that we're not getting when we get it. When we get it put on the journey of healing. And then there's a beautiful Bible verse, James chapter 1. He says, do any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who gives liberally. and doesn't hold back. When we ask God, what is the wisdom that's necessary for me to construct my life and conduct my life? What is the wisdom necessary for me to build my business? to build my family, to build my relationship. What is that wisdom? He puts you on the journey. Do you get a shot of wisdom? <laughs> oh, wow. I get it now. It goes back to Moses. Moses knew the ways of God. The people of Israel saw the ways of God. You need to know. You need to understand. 
It goes so much deeper, so much more. But in the meantime, we give it our best shot. And here's what I don't want you to do. Don't be mad at God. God is doing all he can to get us the wisdom. So now let me help you. When you come tonight and get prayed for by Nasir and his twin brother Nasser, Follow this, okay? Follow this. Number one, how to receive healing. How to, I don't care where you're at. I don't care where you're at in the process. I don't care what you have done in the past. I don't care. But you, you, there is repentance is turning around and following God. Repentance is loving God. If, if sin has caused your sickness and disease, then repent. Did you know sickness and disease can, sickness and disease can come from sin? It can come from a demon. It can come from your environment. It could be something that just is part of your DNA that's coming down your family tree and that we can change anything with the wisdom of God. With just knowing what to do. How to receive healing. Number one, you must believe. You must believe. You must believe. You must believe. Okay, let me give you three things that you need to believe. You must believe that God wants you well and healed. You must believe the end result is you are well. And you must believe God will guide you to your healing. You must believe it. You must believe that God will guide you to your healing. You must believe these things. Now, let's grasp this. How many times, how many times, let me look at my, my note real quick. I wrote something early this morning. I want to read my own handwriting. How many times do you remember the story in the, in the Gospels where Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. Go according to your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. Be it unto you to what you believe. How many times do people do this? They'll come up to the front. They'll let the guest minister or the pastor or the ministry team lay hands on them and pray for them. They'll pray for them and they're in pain. They've got pain in their body that something's wrong. They'll pray. And then they go off to pray someone else and they're done being prayed for. And they walk away. And the first thing that they do is check to see if the pain's there and they feel like the pain is there and say something like, it didn't work. You are now going with what you believe. Be it unto you according to what you believe. Why are you thinking because you got prayed for that you are not on a healing journey at this moment. Why is it okay to say, I'm catching a cold? But you're an idiot if you say, I am catching healing. Amen. Why is it okay for you to say, I want to get rid of my cold or my flu or I have the flu? But it sounds so horrible to say, I'm in the process of being well. Pastor, if they were healed, then they should be able to walk away with no pain. They have just been released the wisdom of God. Sometimes at that instant, like Kent last Sunday, he just said, like the woman with the issue of blood, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, she said, if only the Lord would heal my boom. For him, the wisdom was simply reach out and believe. He just simply reached out and believed. Someone else, there's going to be multiple people tonight that are going to be instantly, 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 instantly healed. But every one of the people who get prayed for, 100% of the people who would be prayed for will be God releasing healing to them at that moment. Yes. Some will have it at that moment, a manifestation of completely everything gone, but others are given the wisdom and they are now going to follow the, the pattern and direction of God to, to, for getting to the end result. The end result. The end result in some people's situations have taken them all the way to their grave. But there they are in heaven, totally well, totally well. I don't want anyone to live less than what God has planned. But do understand, everyone's going to die unless the Lord returns. 
one day they're going to be gone. And God wants us to live as long as we can, but he wants us to live our entire life in his wisdom. Now, Brian in the hospital saw the mercy of God touch him in a wheelchair and him instantly strengthen to the place he got up out of the chair. I saw this. I'm a testimony of it. I was there. I saw him come in the room. I saw them wheel him in. I saw him leave. I know the minister who prayed for him. I was the pastor at the time. I talked to him the next day. I know what was going on. He was well. But he came right back and knocked him back down. Because he left that moment refusing the wisdom of God. Get prayed for and follow the wisdom of God. You must believe God wants you well and healed. You must believe the end result is you will be well. The end is I'm going to be well. You must believe that God will guide you to your healing. Number two, you must obey. You must obey God. You must obey him. And here's what I mean. Number one, you must keep your mind open to the Lord, his spirit, and his word. What is God going to tell you? You are now, at the moment of prayer, getting released of wisdom. You know what? I'm, I'm telling you right now. Just because I know a little bit about physical body, take Kent. God is not saying to Kent, oh, Kent, continue in what you did that caused the pain in the first place because you are now exempt from it. That's not what God's telling Kent. God is telling Kent, I have relieved you of all that pain, but don't bring it on again. How many times did you hear Jesus say to somebody, go and sin no more, that a worse thing would come on you? Now, the wisdom of God for Kent to continue in that healing is not to do what caused it in the first place. He even understands what caused it. He gets it. He knows what, now he's got to figure out a way of doing what he's got to do, that it doesn't repeat itself. For an example, if you are in tremendous back pain and you have back problems and you are just in just pain all the time, you get prayed for, your back gets healed and you're instantly healed and you turn around and you're rejoicing God and thanking God and healed and healed and healed and you go and you sit down in your chair and go, oh God, God, thank you. The pain's all gone. You get in your car and you drive home. All of a sudden this thought in your head. You know what? Your mattress is pretty old. You've had that thing for 18 years. You need a new one. And you say, oh, they're expensive. I don't want to go buy a new mattress. It's fine. It's totally fine. And four weeks later, you are in more back pain than you had before the night that you were prayed for. And you go tell somebody and say, I prayed and God didn't heal me. That thing didn't work. What a testimony you are to Jesus Christ. What an evangelist of the devil you have become. You're refusing the wisdom to maintain. Obey. Number two, you need to understand God. Our Father is trying his hardest to get you to get you the wisdom you need to be healed. There is a wisdom. You say, well, Pastor, why doesn't God just bypass all that wisdom and just heal us? Right when we ask. Every single situation is different because the wisdom for your situation is different, but they're all exactly the same. There's a wisdom of God that you're lacking, you're short of, you don't get it. So, well, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I believe that because I, I didn't... Well, see, that's the part. You don't know it yet. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and wherever you are, there you are. <laughs> and where you're going, that's where you're going. Those are just... Never mind. I got off. Number three. Number three. You must keep your mouth shut. Amen. You got to shut your mouth got to shut up. Some of you, I'm going to tell you right now, some of you maintain physical ailments because you use them for sympathy with other people. You use them as a way to manipulate. 
Use them as a way of getting out of family chores. Use them as, as a way of not being able to do normal. Oh. Use it as a way to be oh, attention getting. Oh, I got a headache again. Oh, the, you know, my back. Oh, this, oh, that. And, and you, are, you are comforting yourself. And some of you have been ill so long that you're afraid to be well. Because you don't know what it's like being well. I, saw, I want to get this testimony. Would you write this down for me, sweetie, as a note? There's a testimony I saw. There's a, a move of God that's taking place. Um, um, it's in the middle, middle United States. It's an evangelist from England who's been praying for people on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night at this one particular church. The pastor used to pastor Brownsville. Assembly of God Brownsville was there during the Brownsville revival, the same pastor. And there is a woman who's a pastor's wife. I, wanna, I saw the video on YouTube. I'm going to get the video. I can't tell you the name. I'll have to go back and research it. I want to play it for you. But she shared her testimony. She was paralyzed for 22 years. She got healed in this meeting. And she's standing up. She's a pastor's wife. Her, her husband's right next to her who's the pastor. She's standing up and she's talking about her healing. And she's talking about times where she didn't believe she was going to get healed. And times that her faith wasn't like mountaintop faith all the time. She was, her, heal, her testimony was so real life. It was just fabulous. But there she was, completely healed. And she said this, after 22 years of being in a wheelchair and 22 years of living a certain way, she goes, I found myself the next day, she's totally healed. Her body hurts. She's in pain. She's using muscles she hasn't used in a long time. She's got to get used to that. She's going through the natural course of muscle pain and stuff like that. She goes, I didn't know what to do with myself. I spent so many hours trying to do the littlest thing. She said it took her more than two weeks, I think it was, to try to get in some kind of routine of life to, just to be in a place of living normal. Some of you have been sick for so long you don't know how to live your life if that thing was gone out of your life. And some of you don't like change. I, 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 it's predictable. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go up and I, I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to take my 25,000 medications. I'm going to, you know, uh, do this. And then at 2 o'clock I puke. And then I do, <laughs> in a, and, you know, it's very, very predictable. God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to be well. He wants you to be well. And what I mean by keeping your mouth shut You've got to quit saying things that are keeping you sick. Quit saying things that are keeping you in bondage. Quit saying things. Again, again, I'm not saying that your denial of a sickness is proof of your healing. I am not saying, no, I don't have tuberculosis. But can you say, I'm on my way to being, re I'm recovering from tuberculosis. I'm being healed of tuberculosis. I'm overcoming it. No, I can't say that. Then shut your mouth then don't say anything. Don't add to your complications. The Bible has a lot to say about your tongue. How your, your tongue will keep you focused in life and how your tongue will keep you on a path and on a journey. What I'm saying is that when you come tonight and get prayed for, your journey begins. Amen. It is not just a journey of getting well, it's a journey of serving Jesus Christ. Stand up. i got more to say, but we don't have time.